Hi, Joanna. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, Shirin. I'm glad to be here. It's wonderful that we finally catch up together. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you today. And we had a beautiful just conversation right before recording. So I'm really excited to talk to you and for you to share your work and your wisdom with uh, the audience today. Very excited. And and I'm sorry, but maybe we can start by introducing you. I know that you have a long history, academic history, but also um, what I've understood from your book, such a long spiritual journey in your own, own life. So maybe you want to start by introducing yourself and uh, for those listeners that haven't heard your, uh, you on your YouTube channel and we go from there. Okay, so this is the most difficult and the easiest question at the same time, you know, <laughs> because, you know, what would you like me to tell uh, people about myself? So I've, I'll start with the present moment, right? So my name is Dr. Joanna Kuyava, but Joanna, I just want to be called Joanna. And I recently wrote the book, you know, The Other Goddess, which is why I call it like my soulful and wild daughter, because I really expose my soul. <laughs> my body is so and soul in this book. And it, it talks really about Mary Magdalene and the goddesses of Eros and secret knowledge. And on my YouTube channel and privately, I describe myself as a spiritual detective because I know it's kind of funny, but it's actually very correct because, you know, I was thinking, you know, on social media, they always ask you, how are you going to describe yourself, right? And I didn't really want to describe myself, so I say it's also author, scholar and spiritual detective. But I didn't really want to describe myself just as a scholar, right? Because it, it, it is just so rigid and very, academia is very often very rigid. It gives us very good skills, research skills, but also it's very limiting about what you can research and how deeply you can go spiritually into something. And then uh, I was, for some reason, although I've been on a very long spiritual journey, I always knew that it is not my job to... Uh, to sign up for any priestess, you know, courses or that that's not my path. And in fact, it would not be good for me, you know, although, mm -hmm. you know, I've been asked. So I thought, OK, so who am I? You know, and then I realized that you, I, I am a spiritual detective, that I'm here to find out what was hidden. I'm here to uncover the secret knowledge. And also I had this illumination, so to speak, in my mind that uh, although I had a uh, academic career really open for me and and I was actually downgrading my academic career <laughs> throughout my career because I wanted to focus on my spiritual journey and on my writing and on my research which was you know more free than academic research necessarily just writing academic papers on particular topics that I saw myself as a bridge between academia spirituality and public so you know like mm -hmm. because some things I realized that some things are very convoluted spiritually especially when you look into esoteric traditions Right, because as a what and I was naturally, I don't know, that's just my I don't know if your listeners are interested in astrology because as an academic I'm very ambivalent about it, but now and more and more I'm responding to it because I, I am really somehow uh I don't know. I, my whole personality is arranged towards esoterica, meaning I'm interested mm -hmm. in, in secret knowledge, but in a very positive way, because very often secret knowledge is associated with occult, you know, and, and very dark things. But I thought like, no, there are good things hidden in secret knowledge. You know, mm -hmm. this is a knowledge mm -hmm. that actually evolves us, that gives us it takes us towards a spiritual evolution. And I'm, very early on, I realized that there's nothing more important in our lives than our spiritual evolution. And that we cannot change the world without changing ourselves first. And then we have to uplift our consciousness, first our individual consciousness, like Joanna consciousness, Shireen consciousness. And then we can only uplift collective consciousness. So if we want to change the world, but we are not changed, we are, we are going just to create more mess. And look mm -hmm. at the world, right? Like there are all these revolutions, there are all of these things that are just the same thing over and over again. And if, for anybody who loves history, like I do, you know, you see just like, it's just the same thing, you know? It's sometimes you think mm -hmm. artists guys like, 
resurrecting themselves and you know is it some kind of reincarnation <laughs> because they're just doing the same thing you know, over and That's over true. but i think and the different names but i think it is because you know we are not working enough on our spiritual evolution we are just too obsessed with technology and other things politics money but what about spiritual evolution? And I think that the esoter beautiful esoteric traditions, which are on the margins of all major religions, you know, talk about it. However, mm -hmm. because they had to be secretive, because first of all, you had to be initiated. Second of all, they knew that they were on the margins because they were going sort of like against very often what the mainstream religi religions were saying, right? So they had to protect themselves. So they're like secret societies. Right. But now the secret societies means like bad, bad, bad. And I'm sure there are some bad secret societies and I don't even go there because I'm not interested in darkness. So mm. I was looking at esoteric traditions, you know, what they teach us in, in especially I was interested in esoteric Tantra because this is where my path took me. And then Gnosticism, which is a form of uh, maybe early Christianity, which actually has deep uh, roots in ancient Egypt and Sumer. Right, mm -hmm. Mesopotamia and Sumer, because actually ancient Egypt, lots of people do not realize it is. I, I don't want to say, <laughs> sound like a lecture now. Do not realize that 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 when you look at the Egyptian mythology, when you look at Egyptian goddesses such as Isis and Hathor, or you know that they actually come from Nimna, Inanna, and Ishtar. Mm -hmm. So, which obviously come from Sumer, and that actually the original stories come from Sumer, when they are being retold in ancient Egypt, and they are being retold in Judaism, and they are being retold in Christianity, and so on. Right. So this is the same story. It's actually mm -hmm. the same story, but in the Western world, it has source in Sumer. When in the East, it really has, for me at least, the East has its source in India. So India also has two traditions. One is Vedantic tradition, which I also studied in depth. I had a teacher and, you know, and it really helps me. It really helped me much more than my own tradition. I was born Catholic, you know, in which I left this because it didn't nourish me. It was a very difficult decision for me because I was a devout Catholic, but it didn't nourish me and it was very dogmatic. And then I turned towards uh, Vedanta and then I discovered that India has this esoteric tradition also, which is, you know, esoteric Tantra, which is completely different as it is seen in India, I'm sorry, in the West or in, in China or, you know, when people talk about Tantra, they usually mean that, which is not the classic Indian Tantra, esoteric mm -hmm. Tantra. However, it is so convoluted and complex. And I thought, and nobody could understand, but I could understand it, you know. So somehow I'm kind of kind of wired this way, right? So but if I can understand it, but I can understand it because I am very committed. So when, for example, when I studied one chapter, Kula Ritual of Tantra Lokas, I, for a year and a half, this is what I did. I put my career on hold, you know, I just was doing what I need to do. And I, and I just focused on it. I meditated open, I studied it, I read it. And then I thought, okay, in my book, The Other Goddess, I wanted to present it in a way that is accessible to people. So this is what, you know, is the secret knowledge. And also the fact that, for example, I knew know that the priestess path is not my path. Like, for example, you, you embrace this path. And it is because somehow I know that I want to be free of this because I'm also naturally ambitious and I had to work on this, but I didn't want to go in this direction. You understand? Mm -hmm. I just, it is just, I am just uncovering this knowledge mm -hmm. and I'm offering this now. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to be in a position of any sort of, so to speak, like power. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. I just like, yeah. this is, this is, this is what I do. I uncover these things and I share this with people. You know, and this is my contribution to spiritual evolution, my own, and hopefully others, you know, if people read the book, right? Mm -hmm. So, so this is, this is, uh, and it keeps me in check also, because I, I lived in a spiritual community as well, and I see how sometimes it, gets into people, meaning they feel very special and so on, you know, and mm -hmm. then I think this is where you uh, weave away from the path, right? Mm -hmm. Because now, mm -hmm. I, so, so this keeps me checked also, you know, like uh, this is what I'm doing. I'm finding this knowledge and I'm honoring this past knowledge, but I'm also, uh, I'm not a fundamentalist in the way that I'm honoring this knowledge. And I, then I ask the question, like I'm asking in my book, in The Other Goddess, what about so, so what? 
Mm. What about us? So there are these archetypes or these goddesses, you know, like for example, starting from Nimna, Inanna, Ishtar, Hathor, Isis, Mary Magdalene, and then there are Sundari and Kali, which are the tantric goddesses. Mm. In, you know, and 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 you know, but they were also in in classic Jungian sense, and I'm talking about Carl Jung and Swiss psychologists, they are like set archetypes. And I say they are not set. Now, what can we, how can we use them nowadays? Because, you know, they were created by a mind that was different than our mind. We are gods, or I don't want to use gods, divine consciousness that is evolving itself through us. So mm -hmm. while we are on a different evolutionary level now, so we have these archetypes, but we can evolve them as well. We can apply them to now, right? To ourselves now and to the situation, you know, and then we can appeal to them in a from a higher level of consciousness, actually. And if you look into esoteric traditions, they talk about different levels. So for example, in Gnosticism, uh, uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene taught three levels of teachings. One for, you know, basic for people, you know, that usually read in a re regular Bible, then to his disciples, more advanced, and then to Mary Magdalene, the highest, the most esoteric teachings. And this is what the Gnostics believed. And in esoteric Tantra, they, they have Tattvas. Tattvas are like a different mm -hmm. levels of reality. And depends on what level of evolution you are, conscious revolution, evolution, not physical, biological evolution, but spiritual evolution, you will understand the same teaching on a different level. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you follow an archetype of Ishtar, let's say, Sherin. So, but you know what? As as you evolve, this archetype evolves with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, so, so uh, this is what I was trying to do. So, uh, okay, but maybe I just stray away a little bit because you wanted me to uh, introduce myself also in academic terms. So. Uh, uh, I have bachelor's degree and master's degree from uh, University of Toronto, from the Pontifical Institute for Medieval Studies and Center for Medieval Studies. And it was the best educational experience I ever had, you know, like really sharp scholarship. And then uh, I was in, uh, in Australia, I got my PhD, right? So, and um, so these are my scholarly credentials on top of my uh, spiritual detective work and, and writing. Mm. Very and exciting. in this book, just to add, you know, in this book, I also describe my own experiences because yeah. when we talk about goddesses and priesthood and archetypes of goddesses, we have to remember that goddess consciousness is different, right? Like it's not logical. So it's I didn't want to write an academic book, which is a very masculine form of writing, but I am kind of especially part one, as you know, is very personal. Right, it's mm. very personal. I'm just really like unpacking my whole body and my soul, right? Mm. As I'm looking at these archetypes and as and as, as I lived through these archetypes, like Aphrodite or or, or, or Radha or, or Sundari, right? Mm. So I'm unpacking these archetypes. But then, you know, in parts two and three, I do research, and in part four, I do research as well, right? But I'm mm. kind of mixing it with this detective journey, like what does it mean, really? So it's mm. not just un un unpacking archetypes, but what does it mean? You know, what does it mean for me? What does it mean for us? What does it mean now? You know, mm. and, and they are wonderful mysteries, and I, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, I have the book here as well, and I feel like it's such, um, it had, as I said before, it has everything that I really am interested in and diving deeper into, and I really love that you're going back to this uh, Sumerian time, because sometimes we're also very fixed, it's like, mm -hmm. almost like we've only lived for 2000 years and this is the history that we feel is like the most important but then when we go back furthermore and really understanding the connection and the link and the lineage and going up all the way to Mary Magdalene and then what's happening now it feels so important to understand because it's shaped um, it's shaped everything into what it is today so but somehow, somewhere, as you said, the 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 feminine was very suppressed, and and that priestess or that uh, feminine 
energy of that that this wholeness is also uh, that it's part of uh, got lost. So I really love like this book as a because also it's like you you share your embodied experiences. So it's not just understanding things logically. It's like through experience we are guided forward what we're investigating, like you say, and what we're diving into and. The things that you tapped into, which I'm really interested in, are exactly that, like the Sumerian uh, uh, stories, mythologies. And as we said, we don't know what these beings really are because we yeah. see them dep- depicted. <laughs> Where did they come from? Like, what? They, Because I, I'm also thinking they, they could not have only been like an imagination or like, as in, in my case, seeing it in a vision, but somehow it's been depicted for, in so many places so where did they come from and that connects us back to uh, the stars and and uh, these uh, yeah visitations that that we've had for so long so i'm really interested in actually diving into there's so much that i want to ask you but i think we <laughs> we could definitely start because it's through you that i also uh, heard nimna because ishtar inana is maybe more known and like more talked about maybe from that time and this that goddess who was that and how did that evolve like you said there's so many goddesses there after that have been coming mm. out in different shapes and forms so i think in many mytho- western mythologies everything as far as divine feminine is concerned with is coming back really to goddess nimna which is a sumerian goddess you know and even like depictions of her is at least 4500 years old you know so really in, in really interesting and nimna is uh, <laughs> She is sometimes considered the mother of all humanity, and she's often described, you know, the tree of life and knowledge and giving a gift or some kind of gift, you know, to a man who is sitting in front of her. And and he is supposed to represent humanity, but she is the goddess, he is the humanity, right? So she is definitely in charge. And the tree of life and knowledge represents also some kind of portal or going between death and life or maybe even different dimensions. Behind her is also an upright serpent, which in Gnostic tradition is interpreted as wisdom. And in most actually Asian traditions is represented as as wisdom. So it's quite interesting. But later in, in, in the mainstream religions, it was perverted into like, you know, devilish or satanic mm-hmm. thing when in fact it represents wisdom. And in Interestingly enough, in in, in uh, esoteric tantra, it represents kundalini energy, which obviously, and I, and I described in my book, you know, experience of kundalini energy, which is uh, which is basically total spiritual awakening and giving and you know being given a cosmic vision. Another interpretation for this uh, upright. Uh, serpent could be you know what some people call nowadays junk dna except that we know that it's not a junk dna it is the mm-hmm. dna that we have to kind of discover in ourselves because we are we are not functioning at all in our full potential and it is the majority of our in dna so imagine if we unlocked it so i think that the goddess inanna is also in mythologies kind of so i you know in in, in most kind of radical uh interpretation she's also considered you know that they she was one of the gods who came from the stars almost like the ancient aliens and then she Mm. was one of the ones people who actually goddesses or gods or beings that tweaked humanity or what was humanity at that stage to help in our evolution so that's that the gift of life and, and and knowledge and wisdom so uh in my book, I say that there are really three possibilities for this. One, that this is some something is encoded in our uh, collective unconscious, you know, and it's emerging and emerging more and more nowadays, especially, right? Like mm-hmm. this divine feminine, this goddess Nimna, but they you know resurrecting themselves, including you know Mary Magdalene as so far as far as I know, the last in this lineage. But you know, mm-hmm. this is I just did this research only until Mary Magdalene. The other one is that perhaps it's one and the same being that is actually uh, reincarnating herself, 
mm. through different times because the names are just changing. It is Nimna, when it is Ina, Inanna, when it is Ishtar, when it is Isis, when it is Mary Magdalene. The symbolism is exactly the same, like in your earrings. Yeah, I can see, right? Okay. Which is Ankh, <laughs> right? So they have the same, basically the same symbols. And I explain the symbols in the other goddess, how, you know, how they are being actually more and more elaborate, but it is the same symbol, right? <laughs> So, uh, like, Ankh is actually very similar to cross. Yeah. To, to yeah. Christian crush, right? And and when, when the tree of knowledge and a reed and a serpent are represented in these earlier images, and Ankh is actually a tree of life and, and the serpent bent together, right? Mm. The cross. Mm. So, so, so these, these are the same images. The other one is, the, and the third one is that it could be, you know, some, actually some biological entities that come and visit us. Mm -hmm. Right, because there are stories about Nimna, about the Anunnaki, right, the Sumerian Anunnaki, and lots of people who are, uh, you know, legitimate scholars. When you, <laughs> when you get them, you know, outside of a camera, they will tell you that you know, yes, you know, these are the stories. But you know, n very few people have actually courage within academia to talk about it, right? So it's you, you see mostly in, in alternative channels. But recently I had a conversation with a professor of religion and I asked him this question and I said, do you think, you know, I told him this, do you think I'm crazy? And he says, Joanna, you're not crazy because, you know, lots of people have these experiences. So it mm. could be actually biological entities or if not biological entities, some interdimensional entities that visit us and through centuries and millennia they will call either gods and goddesses or angels or demons mm -hmm. you know depending how you mm -hmm. perceive them and mm -hmm. then the question occurs are they good or bad mm -hmm. and that's a very interesting question and i think like first of all like humans all beings can be good and bad right but i think it's really I believe that we as humanity really here in this fifth planet, we are at the center of all of this. So it depends, and this same happens actually when people discuss alien abductions, because mm -hmm. actually I really respect the work of Professor Jeff Kripal and, Dani and Diana Pasulka, who wrote a famous book, The uh, American Cosmic. And I just, can I just promote myself a little bit here? She wrote an endorsement on my book. So I was just mm -hmm. like, I was in heaven, you know, because I think like she's a total goddess. Okay. When they say that, you know, uh, that all of this UFO phenomena, phenomena are actually spiritual phenomena. You know, that mm -hmm. there is, there is a, you know, some, for some people it is UFO, for some people it is an angel. So she describes in in her book that, you know, there's a couple and they see this thing happening in the, the light in their bedroom and he thinks, her husband thinks it's a UFO and she thinks it's an angel. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. means the same phenomenon, but, you know, perceived differently. So when mm -hmm. people ask, are these goddesses good or bad? Because, you know, opinions swing sometimes. I say it depends on your on your consciousness at the moment. Mm. They mirror you. They meet you where you are. So mm. that's it's really important. And like for example, your book, right, to stay positive, but not falsely positive. Like I am fine when you're not fine. Be honest, right? Mm. If you're not fine, say you're not fine, and then work on it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and 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 then you know if you meet this entity and you can call upon them, and sometimes they visit you, and especially in dreams they visit you. But you can call upon them, and there are incantations, you know, and then that's what this is what meditation could be, you know, the su sudden insights and so on then you make sure that you meet them in the right state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is more likely that you're going to have a good experience. Mm -hmm. Having said so, in esoteric, but also in classic religious uh, literature, when you meet a divine being, it is so out of a 3D perception that it's freaking people out. Yeah. Because, you know, it is just so much big of it and so much different and it's not a guy nice night with a beard or it's not Virgin Mary, you know, mm -hmm. or it is it just cosmic experience. And some mm -hmm. people are, you know, like freaked out by cosmic experience, right? Yeah. So, so uh, when I had my cosmic experience, I was in a very good state of mind, you know, so, so it wasn't, it was, and it still was mind blowing and I was a mess for three months. Mm. because it completely changed my life and I actually had to go to my I was lucky enough to have a spiritual teacher and his female he sent me to his Devi right his spiritual partner and we had to do mantras and she had to say basically pray to the entities you know please slow down the process because I was falling apart 
Mm. You know, so so so, so even this good experience was kind of for, was too much for my mind. You mm. know, it was too much for my body, and I was dysfunction. I was becoming this. Uh, I couldn't function on a very basic level. Mm -hmm. So so I don't think they are good and they are bad, right? Mm -hmm. It is just where are you at when you have this experience and how you deal with this experience. And if experience is too much, so for example, Eckhart Tolle. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he just let himself go and look, now he's a card Tolle, good choice. When for me mm -hmm. it was so uh, disturbing and maybe I was not ready, I don't know, but I actually kind of uh, forced myself down, right, through the mm -hmm. mantras and so on. So I don't know, maybe it was a mistake, but for me I was falling apart, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Although he said he was falling apart too, he slept on benches and parks at night, you know, like he, he stopped functioning basically. So maybe I should have been more trusting, but I, I guess it wasn't. And, you know, my teacher, spiritual teacher, saw I was falling apart and they helped me to slow down the process. Having said so, I'm still going through the process, but it's slowed down, right? Mm -hmm. So I can function, you know, because yeah. I, I'm not living in ancient you know, India, so I still have to provide for myself. I cannot be like a wandering sadhu, no. you know, like, you know, just villages took care of them and so on. So, um, but this is what it is. So and maybe it's a long answer to your question, but uh, this is, these are my three answers. Either, you know, it's something in our consciousness that is encoded, like this junk DNA, supposedly, you know, it's encoded in our consciousness, remember. Right, so we have these goddesses. The second one is it is an actual entity that resurrects herself and comes back under different names like Isis because she's the same. Isis, Mary Magdalene, Ishtar, Inanna, Nimna, they're the same as far as I'm concerned, right? Or, you know, there are some entities that actually come uh, into our lives, right? And, and I think that uh, and, and I disagree here, for example, with, uh, with some people that I recently interviewed, because I think this entities, I think, probably have a, uh, and many writers on this topic, actually, good in a, uh, you know, they, they want us to evolve, but perhaps, you know, there are some that don't, you know, so I don't know, mm -hmm. but I think the goddesses want to help us to evolve. But it also depends, you know, where we are, because actually human mind is very powerful. If they are interested in us, it's not only because they want us to be our slaves, as the Anunnaki, you know, there's some mm. stories of Anunnaki, they just want to enslave us and so on. It means that we have such powerful minds, that we are such powerful engines sexually and spiritually and intellectually, that if, you know, you are at your highest level or you know high as you can and if you're then the experience is actually positive you know that they, mm -hmm. that you connect on the level that you are you know they connect mm -hmm. with you on yeah. your level so yeah. if you freaked out you know they probably freak you out even more you know what i yeah. mean but if you and but some experiences can be frightening and especially in my recent interview as, as you said on my on my channel you know like i thought mm -hmm. like yeah actually some experiences are frightening and some people had so if it's terrible experiences, so uh, so it is open for a discussion. It was a too long answer for your question. <laughs> no, it was it was so interesting. I mean, everything that you're sharing is there's so much to like unpack from it, and and as you say, it's everything is about what how we're tuning in because in life that's true too. Like, what are we tuning in? Are we tuning into like fear based? Uh, news are we tuning into a collective negative consciousness like where where are we putting our, are we connected are we fully like attaching ourselves to the only one type of reality are we there's so much what people are do we have and then if we are like in Vedanta if we're part of this eternal consciousness that creates everything then there's no separation even from mm -hmm. us and other beings e either because everything is yes. within this consciousness and we're creating this whole reality like this, you know, like the it's like a projection on this screen and, and the screen is this big consciousness that we are, we forgot that we're part of. So we wander around and think that we're not. So and then why does things become so impossible because we live in an impossible like our mind can't even wrap how big our universe is and how many millions and trillions mm. of universes there are like we can't even 
like we can comprehend our world and we look up in the sky and that we have stars but we cannot even comprehend how big like mm. w- how vast so why mm. limit that there's only one form of truth or or, or mm. religion or wh- how we explain things because it's it's all within us like it, it is us that experience it so whether you experience anything with your five senses or in in a dream state on the astral plane or in visions like just because someone else can't confirm what you're experiencing doesn't mean that it's not real because to you it's in this reality it's kind of real but there is so many things and i can imagine that having an experience such as some type of extraterrestrial being no matter what level it's coming in biologic like physically or in a interdimensional way if you already in yourself are not aware that there might be because this is how we've evolved in society we're not open to other possibilities then that becomes scary because how (laughs) you have no idea how to explain it and i love there's this researcher that's speaking a lot about the book of Enoch as well. Maybe you know that, yeah. And how how that whole experience could be translated into something like otherworldly, but how they explained it was from the, their, their level of knowing. So everything has to do with how deep we want to go and how far we can expand. And I don't think that everyone... I mean, th- maybe I will explore one part of it, but never have the opening to explore another I, we don't know mm. like in this lifetime what we're supposed mm. to understand right I and mean, my husband had an interesting experience many years ago he's a very committed uh, meditator it was long before we knew each other and he said that he had this uh, in a meditation this horrible entity showing himself to him and he just because he's really like he's one of the most certain centered people I know you know he's like his witness is so strong you know mm. so so he just kind of witnessed it and then he just embraced it and it just merged into him in with love you know so mm. there are these things I think they're all parts of our consciousness and also I try to bring sometimes Carl Jung because recently I was giving talk, talk a talk for a Carl Jung society and we're talking about shadow and shadow and the definition of shadow is something that cannot be argued against existence. And also it is not bad. It's something that you do not acknowledge. So I think mm-hmm. that sometimes with representations, when they are negative, it is the unacknowledged part of ourselves. Maybe mm-hmm. you're hurting child, maybe some a nightmare from child, you know, childhood or whatever it is. And then we just cannot suppress it. If we suppress it, it will be grow, growing bigger, bigger, right? But if we embrace it, if we look at it, then it's okay. And in mm-hmm. fact, today I was uh, interviewing a, a really wonderful scholar, Celine Neely, and we are talking about this goddess, oh. I call it, goddess, and I call, it, I call this uh, goddesses founder, because there's this ancient... Uh, probably ancient Egyptian, but it was found only in 1945 in Nakh Hammadi in, in, in uh, no, you know, when the Gnostic uh, mm-hmm. Gospels and Gnostic writings were found. And nobody knows how old it is because there's only basically like one copy of this, you know, so it yeah. is like nobody knows how old it is. It, it is. it is written in Coptic, but it could have been translated, you know, nobody knows. However, it is really powerful because it, it says, it speaks as a goddess in the first person. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and it's really Found beautiful. Found the perfect mind. And yeah, that's right. Yeah. Found the perfect mind. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 what she's asking us, it is to embrace dark and light because it's, I'm a virgin and I'm a whore. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a mother and I am the daughter. I am, you know, I am the pitiful one, you know, and I'm a scorn one, but I'm mm-hmm. also the one that, you know, is the light. So I think that unless we incorporate all of this within our own being, within our own consciousness, this, whatever they are called, divinities, goddesses, archetypes, will present themselves to us according to where we are. And that's why all esoteric teachings are talking and referring back to esoteric tantra, you know, or like Pistis Sophia in Gnostic writings, you know, different levels or different tattvas. You know, mm-hmm. so there's like flights of the soul or even in Gospel of Mary Magdalene, she's talking about mm-hmm. different climes or different climates. I think she got mm-hmm. the seven. 
and you have to overcome each of them until you have a pure vision or the doors of your perception are cleansed. Mm. And you know, if you cleanse your doors of perception, then everything is one, it's just a play of consciousness. And sometimes mm. it's light and sometimes a shadow. Do you run away when you go for a walk in a beautiful forest and the sun is going, you know, shining through the trees and there's a shade, you know, sh shade, right? Do you mm. run away from shade? No, it's just, then there is the sun. This is the same way, right? Then, mm -hmm. but first mm -hmm. we have to cleanse the doors of perception, you know. And 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 uh, and it is much more difficult to work on yourself and you know talk about entities and and so on. And 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 I think once, we, but you know, very few people uh, uh, manage to do it to to the very end, right? So these are mm -hmm. the great saints. And you know, they're great the, the Buddhas, the Christ, the Mary Magdalene's, right? Who, mm. who cleanse because it requires it, it requires so much effort and probably a spiritual gift, even, you know. But I believe we are all gifted this way. It's just you know how deeply we want to explore it. Mm. So uh so this is a very actually deep question, you know, who, who are they? But they are there, in my opinion, they are there to remind us you know, of our own greatness, of a great possibility. And they're also here to remind us that the way our civilization is going now is wrong. And that's why I think divine feminine is resurfacing, you know, it's resurfacing, mm -hmm. resurfacing. You know, there are so many people talking about it, you know, more than ever. I would say there are so many books written about it, right? So there are so many lineages, you know, you, you, you take courses, right? And, and so mm -hmm. on about that. And there are so many of them because... Uh, I think we suppressed one form of our own bigness, one form of our consciousness, which is the feminine, intuitive way of knowing, which is very spiral, which is not logical. And mm -hmm. once I think we turn into like uh, ancient Greece, which is glorified very much, and I used to glorify it as well, you know, especially in Western culture, we moved into this kind of cause and effect and logical way of thinking, which is very useful on daily basis, you know, like you want to have cause and effect if you want to catch a train or you want, you know, like you and so on, right? Practical things. But there's a deeper consciousness within us that I call goddess consciousness. You know, we are the goddess, we are the consciousness that is much more difficult to understand because we didn't fully experience her, but she's also the divine mystery of your own being, of your own potential that is here for you to explore, that is here for me to explore, that is here for us to explore. And, you know, and it doesn't tell you that this is, you know, this is the stop, like in a bus stop, you know, it's just, it's endless. And you have to be open to go there and you have to, you know, it is like an adventure, you know, so there will be tribulations and you don't know where you're going, except that you are evolving. And I think we more than ever, we need this other goddess, we need this other form of consciousness nowadays, because our old world is falling apart again, right? Mm -hmm. Like, look what's going on in the world. And uh, I'm trying to stay away from the news, but I know there is all kinds of stuff going on right i just tuned off but i still know it's impossible not to know that things are going apart so and we need this other form of consciousness to perceive the world differently and perhaps to build the world differently but first we have to perceive the world differently through the lens of what i would call uh, you know goddess consciousness mm -hmm. yeah so so interesting and so so much to ask and and just in the book you also uh, talk about um the goddesses of eros uh, and the secret knowledge which it feels like a lot has been kind of hidden from my our awareness and consciousness uh, to not have that opening like you said and that possibility to open up and uh, the, uh, how did you connect uh, Mary Magdalene and Eros together? I mean, you speak about it in the book, but how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, you know, because I was brought up as a Catholic, you know, I was told that she was a prostitute, which now mm -hmm. we know it's not a true. And I explain it in the book that even the Catholic Church admitted in 1969 that it's not true, that it's a scriptural mistake. In fact, the word prostitute is not even used once in the Bible. You know, so and and the uh, the word you know um, 
the woman sinner is a name woman sinner in the Bible, so it's not even Mary Magdalene. And even if it was Mary Magdalene, she was a sinner, which is harmatalos, you know, in Greek, as it was written in Greek, which means mm. she broke Jewish law, which could be anything. Doesn't mean adulteress, mm. doesn't mean prostitute. It could be she didn't celebrate Sabbath or didn't pay her taxes. Okay. Mm. So then I started to look, why is she talk always portrayed, even nowadays in modern Hollywood films, you know, as a harlot? Mm -hmm. Right, like the, the, the word harlot, you know, and then you know, they talk about you know, Inanna and her priestesses being harlots, you know, and sacred prostitution. And I know that there's lots of scholarship, and lots of women wrote one, many wonderful books, but I think it's complete. Sorry, I'm very opinionated nonsense. I don't believe in secret prostitution because it was not a prostitution, sacred mm -hmm. prostitution, you know, mm -hmm. it was ritualistic use of errors which is not a prostitution, doesn't matter if you call it sacred or not sacred, holy or not holy, it's not a prostitution. So people really had no idea, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because, I'm sorry, I'm opinionated here. <laughs> no, it's good. I so agree. Because I have learned in esoteric tantra that an erotic act can be used as a radical form of worship, of connecting mm -hmm. with the divine, because sexuality, conscious sexuality, especially female sexuality, and that's why I think it was suppressed, is so powerful that can be used as a ladder straight to the divine mind. Mm. Mm. That's not a prostitution. No. Okay. And I don't care whether we call it sacred or not sacred. You know, I just mm -hmm. didn't get the point properly. All right. So I'm going to be very opinionated here. So I think so this is when it gets a little bit conspiratorial because, okay, and then I trace it back, you know, so there was Inanna, you know, she had this uh, uh, priestess and Huenada who wrote these beautiful erotic poems, you know, the most beautiful erotica probably ever written, you know, mm -hmm. and when she's channeling goddess Inanna, right, and when she's calling upon her lover Tumus or Dumuzi and so on. So, and, and, and Isis, who obviously, you know, and there's a story of resurrection and passing through the portal of death and life, you know, so they're all the same for me. But the reason why it gets a little bit conspiratorial, I would say, because I say, why were they hijacked? Why were they called harlots? Because it's not an innocent name. Not only sacred prostitute, I really do not buy it, but, you know, harlot and prostitute, and also the priestesses were called harlots or, you know, prostitute sacred or not sacred so i thought that there may be a couple of reasons one of them is that uh, it was a it was a patriarchy and it continues to be in some ways and patriarchy i'm not saying anything against men i love men i you know i'm very in a very happy relationship but patriarchy is a system mm -hmm. patriarchy is a system of control of human beings but men are controlled in a different ways than women right mm -hmm. but men still had more freedom at least sexually right than women and in many ways they had more choices right but they still you know were controlled so for some reason they either didn't understand it and they understood they understood it's a power sexuality especially female sexuality is a huge power it is like a nuclear reactor okay mm. or you know, they knew that it was so powerful and they knew that it can, can take you straight to the mind of uh, God or, you know, the divine consciousness. And that's why they didn't want us to go there. Mm -hmm. Because who needs priests then? Right? Mm -hmm. Who needs, you know, intermediaries? All the control that lots of mainstream religions are putting on people, you know, and perhaps these controls were necessary at certain level of evolution, you know, when, you know, there is some morality, do this, don't do that, you know, Ten Commandments, you know, like these are good rules for any society to live. You don't want people to kill people. You don't want people mm -hmm. to steal, mm -hmm. right, from other people. These are decent rules, right? Mm -hmm. But it is, but, you know, ab above that, everything else is really like sort of a control, right? It's like a form of brainwashing. And then suddenly there's this powerful raw tool, mm. you know, that the priestess is used to get to the like a divine code, you know, to the to the source, right? So for example, through sexual act or through sexual rituals. So that was either feared or considered dangerous, or maybe some people knew how powerful it is and they wanted to use it for their own nefarious reasons, as some people, you know, in conspiratorial theories 
uh, claim. Yeah, I don't go there because you know there's enough darkness. I'm just focusing mm -hmm. on, on on light side of this, and then they kind of hijacked it and they said this is all BS. Right? They said this is nonsense. This is like women's talk, or you know, they were just uh, stupid women, or they were just prostitutes, or they were harlots, or you know, they were just priestesses who had some sex with some guys, so the, the harvest is better. I'm completely not buying into this. So I think that, so so th this is this part that, that teaches us that there's a potential also, there's a divine potential also in eros and in eros sexuality when it is consciously approached. You know, that's why there are rituals, and I, in my book I call it sexual alchemy, right? Mm -hmm. And some people have sponta spontaneous awakenings through this, you know? And I call it erotic connection because some people have experiences, spontaneous experiences, they meet someone and they immediately know them, you know, mm -hmm. and through mm -hmm. sexual acts. Sometimes if it is just a raw sex, it's nothing. You may not remember somebody's name after that. It was just great sex. But some people meet and, and it's like they know each other's souls. Mm. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and I give examples of this because people uh, told me about their own experiences. So what I'm saying, there is a great and beautiful and redeeming power of Eros that these goddesses and these priestesses carried, including Mary Magdalene. And I think this is what she was actually practicing with Jesus, you know, and I'm less interested in this more polite theories of Mary Magdalene and Jesus, like they were nicely married and they had children. I said, maybe they did but they were there to complete a mission. They were not mm -hmm. there to start a nice family. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Maybe they had a family and it's good. I'm happy for them. At least there is some happy ending to this awful story, right? Like, yeah. uh, right? But what I mean it is she was helping him and they were helping each other, you know, in this process uh, of, of ascension, you know, because this mm -hmm. is what at, at the end I believe happened there. So, 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 and, and, and they were also using arrows, but arrows is only one of many ways that you, know, you can ascend. It's just one of the tools. Mm. Yeah, that's, I mean, I love that, uh, that aspect of the book and, and that you bring this up because it is, like you said, it's been kind of, um, like you said, in the patriarchal system, since it is probably once been very, uh, like uh, the woman's body can depict like the the birth of the creation so it's kind of mm -hmm. like uh, mirroring this bigger uh, cosmic mm -hmm. womb and mm -hmm. then that's very powerful and we can see that in the old uh, of course in the old uh, statues of these goddesses and the body and and the birthing positions so something very sacred there and and as I said in 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 the in my uh, priestess training, it's it's the desire mystery that leads to that. So why has the desire mystery been suppressed? Um, mm. Because it, it 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 is the the mystery that leads to creation, and that's within us. And we're like just mirroring this bigger bigger like creation. The movement yeah, it's, of of the universe, of, of, yeah. of the divine consciousness, I completely agree with this. So, so, so this is what, so this is what we do, you know, and this is what I think the priestesses were doing. So I thought, actually, thought like this is, it's just not fair that they are being portrayed mm -hmm. like that, you know, like this is not fair that Mary Magdalene and I was a little girl in a Polish church, and I thought that she's a prostitute. This is not fair. You know, mm -hmm. so because they carry the knowledge, which now we call it secret knowledge because it was suppressed or hijacked, you know, that would help us to evolve just in mm -hmm. a different way, not through exactly. control, but through conscious use of it. Nobody's mm -hmm. asking people to just go and have sex. That's not even Tantra. Right. No. It's not it's not conscious sexuality. It's not sacred sexuality. But, you know, conscious approach towards this powerful tool, which is our consciousness and which is also our errors, our sexuality and our desire when it is properly directed. Imagine, you know, the power of that. Right. Imagine mm -hmm. the power of it is just the focus of it, if you can give it a focus. So but it is, you know, um, it requires some self-discipline, but it is also more unpredictable, right? So mm -hmm. it is also more unpredictable, and it gives actually prominence to, to a woman, right? It gives prominence to the feminine. And then obviously in patriarchal societies, 
it was um well, it wouldn't be considered really, right? Like no. give, give prominence to, to, to the feminine. But mm -hmm. I think the masculine, the divine masculine only benefits through the union with the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to replace divine masculine with divine feminine. I want to bring up the divine, unveil the divine feminine to the level, you know, but it's on the same level of divine masculine. You know, mm -hmm. and then we can have true partnerships, then we can have a true sexual alchemy, then we can unite also the masculine and feminine within our own beings. And in most esoteric traditions, you have to uh, you have to equalize the feminine and masculine within your psyche to actually mm -hmm. move up spiritually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. that's that's really important to understand because it's not about replacing, it's a yin and yang. You have to mm. balance. There's always a balance that creates the the unity and the wholeness. And that's when you're as healthiest and the wholeness and your highest potential is when also in your body, yin and yang is, is uh, balanced. So I really love that. I would really recommend everyone to <laughs> check out your book. It's on Amazon. I'm linking... Uh, to to the 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 book in the show notes and also to your YouTube channel, which I really love and so great that you you're you have so many amazing guests. I actually just got Celine's book, uh, The Rape of Eve, which is so yeah that that whole story. It's is amazing. So interesting She's an amazing unpack. scholar. Yes. So I'm really yeah I'm I I feel like we could talk so much more because there's so much. Uh, I mean, we didn't even get into the Sophia and that whole thing that I wanted to talk about. But I think that we will definitely connect again and have another chat because you have so much uh, experience and, and wisdom in this. So I want to really thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you so much, Sharon. It was such a rare pleasure to speak with you tonight. Thank you. Oh, thank you.